and I'm going to be introducing to you um, our uh, event sponsors and our speaker, and I'll let them tell where they're coming to you from. And uh, one of the things I want to start out with, I'm going to share my screen and uh, show also uh, websites of our sponsors. I don't see anyone from the chamber on. Uh, Steve Cox is usually our big supporter, economic development uh, director for the chamber. So um, I'll give a shout out for the Rogers Lowell Area Chamber of Commerce. I've been associated with them for eight years and uh, helped chair and serve in their small business council. And they are huge uh, proponents and supporters of small business and especially women entrepreneurs. And so we wanna give a shout out to the chamber and I'll show their website in a little bit. Um, but next, I'd like to um, introduce um, Audwood Vaughn uh, with Bank OZK. So, Audwood, if you want to say hello to everyone and tell us where you're coming from today. Absolutely. Thank you, Martha. My name is Audwood Vaughn, and I'm the market president for Benton County uh, at Bank OZK. I'm actually, uh, my office is located when we're in our offices uh, on Walton Boulevard in Bentonville. Um, Bank OZK is pleased to partner with Startup Junkie and the Rogers Lowell Chamber to sponsor the Her Entrepreneur uh, Journey Series. Bank OZK, along with Startup Junkie and the Chamber, have, all have a rich history of supporting small businesses grow. Martha does an excellent job of presenting, and in, ad in addition today, Lance Sexton is going to join us from our bank in a, uh, he represents our Government Guaranteed Lending Division to discuss SBA loan opportunities. Lance is a valuable team member to Northwest Arkansas and has over 30 years of experience in SBA lending. Thanks for joining us today. Great. Lance, you want to say hello and tell everybody where you're coming from today? Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm excited we're doing an entrepreneur uh, presentation and I'm actually at the home of an entrepreneur one that I'm very proud of I'm operating out of one of the uh, and I am a bank OCK government guaranteed lending specialist but I'm operating today for this zoom conference out of uh, one of the remaining strong Radio Shack stores uh, in this part of the world owned by my dad uh, Behind me, guys, is a computer graveyard. They stuck me over in the corner, but uh, I'm excited to be here. Martha and I have worked together for a long time in both uh, entrepreneurial development activities and small business lending, so I'm very excited to be here. Thanks, Lance. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go um, to my screen share and show you some websites, and then I'll launch into my, my PowerPoint. Um, Caleb is going to be here. Caleb is our um, marketing and events director for Startup Junkie Foundation. So he'll be monitoring the questions if you have any issues or things come up. And then he'll help us at the end um, as we take questions. Uh, so I'm going to present some of the basics. And then as we get into the meat of especially SBA lending due to Lance's expertise, uh, Lance will be guiding and giving you some, some education and tips and ideas on that. And then at the end, we'll have plenty of time for any questions you have. And then of course, we'll be providing um, after this is over a copy of the presentation to everyone so you can reach out to me or Lance um, for information. So I'm gonna share my screen now. I wanna show you um, some uh, websites. If I can get it to let me do that. Is. All right. So this is the uh, Rogers Lowell Area Chamber of Commerce website. Does everybody see that, Caleb? Mm -hmm. Great. So this is an excellent resource for you. Um, I really encourage you um, to join a chamber wherever you are when you start your business. But also, I encourage you to go to this, our uh, event co-sponsor, Rogers Lowell Area Chamber of Commerce site, because they have some incredible free resources um, on the site of, uh, of, of workbooks and um, information and just it's all free to the public. There is a section that's members only, but they have lots of information out there for you to take advantage of at no cost. 
And then this is the website for our presenting sponsor, Bank OZK. Um, for years, when I was growing up, it was known as Bank of the Ozarks. Um, this is a bank that started in Arkansas in 1903, and it has now grown to be in 10 states with 250 branches. And I just love the new logo, the idea of the Bank OZK. So they are able to offer this national perspective and national um, resources, and yet they're local. So there is a Bank OZK branch in every major Northwest Arkansas town. And so um, I just want you to be familiar with that and understand the concept of having a community bank. And I'm gonna talk about this a lot in the presentation. I will tell you in the recent COVID crisis, my clients who had relationships with local community banks are the ones who were able to get in the first rounds of funding on some of the loan programs we'll talk about with Lance. So it's really important to have a relationship with, with a bank, um, especially one that has real people that can help you. Then um, this is our website for Startup Junkie. This is where you can go. You can go to the About section, our team. You can read about all of us and our backgrounds. So my background, as Lance said, we work together in, um, in, in banking. So I used to be actually a desk banker. I was an attorney and represented mostly banks um, in bankruptcy, foreclosure, and collection cases, and then worked at the Small Business Center at the University of Arkansas when it was located in the Walton College. And I'm also a former, very proud public school English teacher. So um, you can read all about us and our uh, team, and you can go here anytime to events and click on that, and it will show you um, any upcoming webinars we have and hopefully in the future. So here you can see our Her Entrepreneur Journey, and then hopefully in the future more in-person events. And we usually have about three events a week here at Start Junkie. There's never a cost um, or any charge for our services and um, there's never any cost or charge for our events. So we would love for you to consider um, coming to some of our programs. And then you can always just go here to meet with us to book a free online appointment, or we are in a public building. We do have mask requirements, but we have large rooms we can socially distance in if you want an in-person meeting to help you start your business or grow one. So Zoom, phone call, in-person, we'll work with you um, any way we can. And here is Lance's bio. I figure it's a little easier than just having to listen to me talk so much. Um, but this is a great announcement about when Lance joined Bank OZK three years ago. And he has an extensive background. He's a little humble, but he's been doing this for over 30 years. And we're very fortunate to have his expertise. He does national speaking engagements all over the country at major events. Um, he has worked for the SBA. He has worked for banks. Um, as he does now and then at the University of Arkansas and he comes from a background like I do of many generations of small business owners. So we're, we're really proud for you to have this opportunity to have this presented to you at no cost and this expertise. And now I'm going to switch over to my PowerPoint presentation. We will get to the meat of the substance. So this is our Her Entrepreneur series. Um, part of my focus here at Startup Junkie, we are um, a, a 501c3 nonprofit foundation. We are primarily funded by the Walton Family Foundation and then also from the Arkansas Economic Development Commission to empower entrepreneurs in Northwest Arkansas. And one of my mission goals here is specifically to empower women entrepreneurs. The um, Arkansas Economic Development Commission program for minority uh, businesses uh, officially added women as minority classified disadvantaged businesses um, through an act of Governor Hutchinson about three years ago. Um, Arkansas only has about 24-25% of its small businesses owned by women and the state of Arkansas and the Walton Family Foundation and Startup Junkie Foundation all want to see that change. If women are 50% of our population, they should own 50% of the businesses. Um, I have written articles and done a lot of research and presentations about why this is. Um, you know, it was until 1978 that women could be required to have a male family member or a husband 
have to sign off for them for loans or for checking accounts. That seems a little funny to us today to think that that could possibly happen, but women um, are still a little bit behind in the access to capital and the attitudes of society toward a woman owning a construction business or a trucking company. And we're starting to see great strides and women are catching up very quickly and doing wonderful work. And so we here at Startup Junkie are very, very committed to this process and to empowering women to become business owners in Northwest Arkansas. So when you're starting to talk about how do you finance a business, your savings, that is the number one place that I see people dig into to start their own business. Uh, friends and family, very common for someone to get a loan from their parents or have money gifted to them from a family member. Um, one of the things I talk to people about a lot is let's make sure and possibly document that. It is a wonderful idea to, if you're going to go that route, to have a uh, actual note drawn up by a lawyer because especially, you know, if Aunt Sally has children and she were to unfortunately pass away, you would want the agreement between you and Aunt Sally to continue um, as to the monthly payments th that were being made. Further, if you go on to seek a loan from a bank, you're going to have to list that as a debt and they're going to want to see that that debt was memorialized in a note or something. Um, leasing companies, if you just need a piece of equipment, you can sometimes actually finance that piece of equipment through the company that sells the equipment. Bank financing, which is a part we're gonna talk about a lot in this um, seminar, because I think any small business, no matter how small it is when it starts, in Northwest Arkansas, there is great potential to grow and to grow fast. And you need to, as early on as possible, at minimum, establish that business bank account, that checking account at a bank, and they're going to have a whole team of retail professionals who can help you with your POS, your point of sale system, help you with um, uh, deposits. Uh, they have machines now where you can just scan checks. You don't even have to go to the bank to make a deposit. But when you hire a bank and set up a business bank account, you get a whole team of professionals to help you for free with your business planning. So at minimum, you need that. But then we'll go start getting into the loan situation and building that trust and that relationship with banks. We will talk about alternative finance options. Some of you who are listening in here, you're gonna hear me say things like, banks like to see a 700 credit score. And if your credit score is 500, don't close your ears. Do please continue to listen. There are, I work with people all of the time with very low credit scores. And part of my job is to help them rebuild that credit. And there are lots of steps to the capital ladder. And so when I use the word capital, that just means access to money for your business. And so listen and learn how to possibly repair that credit and that there are alternative um, funding options. And those of you who do have stellar credit, you know, you're like, I have an 800 credit score. I don't need to listen to this section about alternative financing. Do listen, because especially if you're a woman thinking about starting a business, you might come into contact in the coming years with women who aren't as fortunate. Most people I know whose credit um, gets harmed is due to a divorce or a disability or a death in the family. So most of the time I haven't met people who show me oh, my credit score is bad because I just didn't care. I just didn't want to make my payments. I I've never met someone in that position. It's been some sort of terrible life event that has caused that. So let's all learn together so we can empower other women as we come to them, those with low credit scores and those with great credit scores and, and building that community and empowering each other. I, I promise you givers get in this world. So, so let's all learn together and understand all different sides of this capital ladder uh, process. One thing to know is don't ever get too excited and start signing contracts if you're starting a business just because you think you're gonna get a loan. Uh, the loan process is detailed and I will tell you, you need to show some grace to those bankers because after the 0809 crash, a lot of regulations and a lot of paperwork came into play and they're gonna have lots of boxes to check and lots of I's to dot and T's to cross. And it's gonna be a little bit of time before you know for sure that you're gonna get that loan. So don't be signing a lease. Um, maybe they might let you put a caveat in there that this lease starts if you get full funding at so-and-so bank, but I doubt it. You're just gonna to have to wait. Um, don't sign contracts with vendors. Um, I'm gonna order $20,000 worth of inventory from you now in July and I want it delivered in November. 
don't do that until you know that your loan's approved because once you sign that dotted line, you're on the hook. Um, grants. Now, this is a presentation I've done for years and you know, always, always what we told people is grants are for nonprofits. Grants are from foundations or the government to support community programs that replace government need. And so, you know, the, the government doesn't give a grant for you to open a women's shoe boutique. The world really doesn't need more shoes. I want more shoes and that's great. And I hope you can open that business and do wonderful with it if that's your passion, but you're not typically gonna get grants from the government because that's not a community service. Now, yes, you have been seeing a lot of grants offered in the recent months due to the COVID crisis, but that is a special situation. And those grants have typically been for existing businesses. Sometimes they have caveats like you have to have been in business two years to even apply for those grants. So that's a special situation. What the government does offer is this U.S. Small Business Administration, and we're going to call it the SBA throughout this um, presentation to save my, 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 my mouth a lot of extra work, but the SBA is this wonderful government-backed program that the U.S. government offers to encourage banks to take the risk to make loans to small businesses. That's how the government helps for-profit businesses. It is very, very rare to see grants for small businesses, just free money, and extremely rare to ever see a grant for a startup. Um, don't assume you can get a bank loan just because you have a 750 credit score. That's great, and that's one part of the step, but there are lots of other little boxes. For example, if you say, well, I, will, I have great credit, um, but um, I don't wanna pledge any of my personal assets, and I don't wanna personally guarantee the loan. Well, if you don't believe in it enough to sign on the dotted line, I'm not really sure why a bank should believe in your business enough. So, you know, there, there are going to be different situations and it's a total picture, which is a good thing. Because if one part of your financing picture is low and two parts are high, yay, it meets in the middle and the bank is able to figure something out. Uh, beware of online lenders and too good to be true. And we're going to talk about some of those more in detail coming up. Just beware. I'm not saying they're bad. I know lots of people who have started businesses because that was their only option, but just understand what you're getting yourself into. I can't get my, there we go. Sorry, my forward wasn't going. Um, friends and family is one of those first ones I talked to you all about. And like I said, the great thing, lots of people start a business with loans from friends and family or just gifts from friends and family. Um, it's highly advisable, like I said, to hire an attorney to have a formal loan agreement. I really advise that. Do realize, you know, not to give you personal advice, but it can cause some issues if you don't pay it back. Um, the example I gave you about getting the loan from Aunt Sally and it, you're supposed to get to pay you know, 200 a month for five years, but Aunt Sally unfortunately passes away in year two and her children find out about this loan and they may say, uh, we want that paid off now. You owe, our, you owe us this money back because we need that money. If you have the note in place, her heirs would have to honor that note. That would, note would be a part of the estate and the judge would decide to whom the payments go. So, so even if it's friends and family, let's, let's get it in writing. That's a great idea. Uh, savings and retirement plans. Um, I know pe many people who have taken withdrawals from um, retirement plans to have that uh, down payment, that initial cash infusion in order to get a loan. Um, there are some called ROBS, which, are, which is an acronym that stands for a rollovers to start a business. Um, and that is a really complicated process. Um, you're going to have to have an attorney and an accountant who regularly do this. So anytime, if you're thinking about using your retirement account to fund starting a business, be sure you either reach out to me or talk to your banker about it first to make sure you're referred to someone we know who's experienced with this. Here's why. I am a really positive, happy-go-lucky person, but I am scared to death of the IRS. And you should be scared to death of the IRS, all right? If you don't follow their rules and do exactly what they say, the IRS, state taxing authorities, can shut your business down and cause immense issues for you. And the best way to not be scared of the IRS and the state taxing authorities is to get good quality legal advice and accounting advice and I call it the sleep at night factor. You know that you've done everything exactly the way you're supposed to. 
you know that you're recording things and documenting them correctly. So be very careful on these issues because retirement accounts involve the IRS and taxes that are owed and taxes that aren't owed. So be very, very careful with this. Um, leasing, if all you need is a sewing machine, if all you need is a printing press, that's it. You've got the space, you've got some cash, that's all you need. Sometimes contacting the company that sells that piece of equipment is a great way to get it financed. And um, they have good interest rates sometimes, but I will caution you a lot of times the term. And when I talk about the term of a loan, that's how many months of repayment. A lot of times with equipment leases, the term is really short. So that means the payment's higher each month. And you might be um, your payments are lower. And with SBA loans, we're gonna talk later, as long as they're under 15 years, there's typically no repayment penalty if you pay it off early. So you could make those low payments and when your business starts rocking and rolling, you can maybe pay it off um, earlier if you want to. However, these leasing um, options um, are great, either financing or just leasing the equipment and then later buying it. So checking with the equipment company and seeing, do you offer a leasing program? Will you actually finance me buying the piece of equipment? Um, those are all great things to discuss with your banker. If you have a banker about what they think you should do in that situation with your total loan package or through the company. Um, factoring companies, these are very interesting. Um, you can see some factoring companies um, that do this, they loan money based upon money that's going to possibly come to your business due to contracts. Uh, Blue Vine is a national one. Um, we have one in Arkansas called Exchange Capital Corporation and uh, Diversified Resources. What they do is say you have a contract, you're an IT person, and you have a contract with a major company and you know you're gonna get paid $100,000 over the next year to completely redo all of their um, um, internet and um, computer systems and everything. But you've got an opportunity to get another contract, a short-term one that you could make a bunch of money on, but you don't have the capital right now to hire staff and buy that equipment. You can sell that accounts receivable contract to a factoring company and get 50 to 80% of the money right now. And then you, that funds you to do the other things that you need to do, but you're going to lose 20 to 30% of that income. And so that's how those companies uh, make your money. And so the great thing is it's quick. The downside is you lose some of that income and there's only certain kinds of contracts they'll do that on. Typically, a lot of times they do that with trucking companies, manufacturing uh, and service companies, like I said, like IT. So that's what those factoring companies are. Online lenders. This is something I get questions from uh, people a lot. And my number one answer is take the time to read the agreement. Read it very much in detail. They don't hide what they do. It's in there. It's going to be in the document that you sign online. The problem is people don't take the time to read it. And one of the situations that people get themselves into is they start a business and they don't have a line of credit. They don't have a backup. And when I talk about a backup, I'm going to talk about it for two reasons. Backup one is, yeah, something bad happens, uh, like the COVID crisis lately. All right. If you didn't already have a line of credit at a bank and your profits are going down, that's probably not the best time to apply for a line of credit. But I also want to talk about using it for good things. I've had clients before, you know, say you have a bike shop in Northwest Arkansas and you hear about a bicycle store in Oklahoma that's going out of business. And a friend of yours says, hey, this guy is selling his bikes for 25 cents on the dollar. He wants to get rid of his inventory because he's going through a divorce and he needs them gone in a week. If you already have a line of credit, um, you're able to just contact your bank and draw that money and go buy those bicycles and make a great deal. When you get in a hurry and say, oh, I need to buy those bikes and you just 
hurry up and go online and borrow money, you can get into one of these situations that you have an extremely high interest rate and extremely fast repayment requirement. So a lot of times these are only six to 12 months. So my goodness, think about that. If you borrow $50,000 and you have to pay it off in 12 months, how high that payment will be. Also, they use the words constantly, fees. We only charge 3% daily fees. And people think, oh, 3%, that's great. That is not an interest rate. That is not an annual interest rate. That's a daily fee. And I've done my research and you can do the research and I'm not bad mouthing cabbage. Some people need that and it's their only option. And I understand that. But typically that translates to a 24 to 27% interest rate. And I have seen people bring me contracts and are just in tears and they're like, I didn't understand, I didn't understand and we can't make these payments and this is horrible, what are we gonna do? Read the documents and understand fully what, what you're getting into. Credit cards, no judgment. I know several people who have started small businesses with credit cards, especially very young people. Um, I know a young woman who that's what she did. And when I was in banking, I helped her refinance those credit cards because she was doing great with her business now. So she kind of got lucky because those credit cards were at 16 and 19 percent interest and she couldn't have continued that much longer but luckily her business took off and she was doing great and she actually got married and she had a spouse and had great credit and a great job and we were able to refinance some super high credit cards put them in a new line of credit at the bank extend her credit and help her grow her business but what i typically see is people use a bunch of really high interest credit cards and they try to grow their business too soon and then they're stuck with this your your speaker hello yes okay it was just it was kind of cutting out there for a minute okay can you all hear me now yes that's better i think okay. it was just like echoing or something yeah okay. that's better thank you thank you feel free to jump in y'all tell me anytime thank you so much if you can't hear me or you can't see something or i i say i'm seeing something and you don't see it so thank you for that all right, crowdfunding and microloans. So we hear a lot about um, different crowdfunding sites and I want you to understand the differences in those. Some are donations, some are loans. So these are typically for startups, for sole proprietors. And when we talk about sole proprietors, that's people who typically have not incorporated and formed an LLC. So it's just them, it's just Martha doing business as Martha's Landscaping Service. That's just what I call myself, Martha's Landscaping Service. I've opened a business bank account just to separate my finances, but it's just a DBA. It's really just me and my social security number. I'm just gonna add a little page to my uh, tax return next year, and it's gonna say Schedule C, income from the business. Then there are those who are incorporated and they are now two different people. They're Martha, the individual, and Martha, the member manager of so-and-so LLC. Or if they set up an S-Corp, which is not so common anymore, I would be the 100% shareholder, maybe president of Martha's Landscaping Inc. So typically, uh, folks who are just kind of starting these side businesses or startups, also um, you'll see people with community projects, they want to clean up a park or have a festival, they will use these crowdfunding uh, platform. So these crowdfunders are companies that have created an online platform and their companies, I'm going to talk about how some of them are for profit, um, some of them are nonprofit. And they're a way for you to present a profile, tell a story and raise money through this company for you to start your company. Um, some of the very well-known ones are like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and they have different concepts. Indiegogo is usually for like artistic things, really kind of cool, funky businesses. Um, a lot of people who want to create a new board game will design a board game and do a crowdfunding on Indiegogo. And so you would loan them a minimum of say a hundred dollars and if you loan them a hundred dollars then you get one of the first um, examples of the game to roll off the manufacturers um, line when they do that uh, kickstarter people we have had some very successful uh, companies in arkansas live sim outdoor wear is well known for having raised hundreds of thousands of dollars on kickstarter now kickstarter indiegogo um, and then 
uh, GoFundMe, do realize those are for-profit companies. That's a startup that somebody started to make money providing a place for people to raise money to start businesses. So there are going to be fees. There's going to be anytime someone um, donates to you or was to loan you a dollar on um, GoFundMe or Kickstarter or Indiegogo, you're only going to receive about maybe 85 to 90 cents of that because there's going to be fees for the Visa and the MasterCard and the PayPal. And then the company is going to take a fee for every time someone donates to you or loans to you. And then they're going to have, some of them have platform fees just to be there and some don't. So do realize those are for-profit companies and there's going to be some fees. Also with like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, people expect to get something if they donate to you. Like I get the first pair of these new pants in this new color. I get the first shot at buying this new little robot toy. Um, another one that we have become very familiar with in the last um, nine months is Kiva. And Kiva is an international nonprofit small business micro lender. Typically, Kiva loans have just been from 1,000 to 10,000. They've been recently expanded to 15,000. Um, I am the Northwest Arkansas Kiva Hub Manager, and these loans were created by a couple. They were uh, missionaries in Africa, specifically in the country of Uganda, and they saw many women there. And as missionaries, they felt that these women didn't need a handout. They needed a hand up. And they wanted to work with these incredible women who had fish selling businesses and goat milk selling businesses and made clothes for people. And they wanted to teach them to be business women. So they set up this Kiva platform where people all over the world could go online and loan money to them in very small micro loans. Like I think the first Kiva loan, I know it was to a woman in Uganda who sold fish and I think it was for $50 just to put like a roof on her fish hut. And it has grown since 2005. It is international in 78 countries. And in um, 2012, it came into the United States as Kiva US. Now in the United States, Kiva loans are only for small businesses or sole owned and run nonprofits. It is not for personal needs such as needing a prosthetic limb or um, um, tuition for children to go to school, which you'll see on some of the Kiva International. Um, but Kiva is a nonprofit, um, which means if you contact us at Startup Junkie and we help you fill out the online application, you will have to get five, 10, or 15 local people to loan you $25 that goes through Kiva. Kiva holds their loan. Then you get launched on the international Kiva site, which has 1.9 million lenders worldwide. They all have Kiva accounts and they all use their PayPal to loan you $25 or more. And then every month after that, when you make a payment, Kiva takes your payment, say $200 a month, and then it distributes it to all the people that loaned you $25. And they build that money back up in their account. And when they get their 25 or hundred bucks back, PayPal then transfers it back to their PayPal account. Kiva itself is a nonprofit. So um, the Walton Family Foundation has donated to Kiva for our Northwest Arkansas borrowers to have a match fund. The Wrigley Chewing Gum Family, the Wrigley Foundation donates to Kiva. And so if you get a Kiva crowdfunded loan, it's 0% interest, no fees, because the entity itself is a 501c3 and PayPal donates its use. PayPal gets a big tax deduction every year for donating its use for free to Kiva. So that's some examples for you of the different um, crowdfunding. Years ago, people were really wary and scared of these crowdfunding. They felt like people were gonna get ripped off. They weren't gonna get their money, but just do your research and find these very reputable ones like these ones I've listed. And, and that's not something to be fearful of if you just need you know, a smaller loan to get yourself started. If you're not scared to tell people your story online, if you're comfortable with social media, all those things will work out just fine for you. All right, now we're gonna start getting into what I think is kind of um, the main way and the main guide that we want our um, women entrepreneurs to, to head toward. Um, what we talk to people about in Northwest Arkansas a lot is about the power of having a team and the power of having everyone in Northwest Arkansas 
who supports entrepreneurs on your team to help you. And that includes having a bank team. And so I talked to you earlier about the retail team, which is your bank account, your payment system, your checking account, possibly a savings account. All of those people will help you grow your business and understand that system. And then also is a loan officer. And we're going to talk about all the different loan options. I'm going to give you a little overview of what kind of the typical ones are. Um, and then Lance is going to explain to you as a person who's done this for 30 years, what banks are really looking for, how to prepare yourself for that, and why using a local community banker is so important. So we basically have, there are lots of other kinds of loans, but we, we aren't doing this webinar all day. So the two main areas are going to be what we call P&I. That's kind of the term, P&I loans, principal and interest. Each month you make a payment for a set term and part of the principal um, goes to the total amount that you loaned and then part is interest and that's the money that the lender makes for all that the lender is doing for you, providing you the money, providing you the staff and the team to monitor your loan and be there to help you. Typically, if you're a startup, you're not going to get a fixed rate loan unless you have a very nice piece of real estate that you already own and you're going to title that over to the business and have that as the collateral. So when we start talking about collateral, we talk about risk and we have a scale of risk for bankers from here to here. And so bankers like dirt. Everybody likes real estate because real estate's not going away. And in Northwest Arkansas, real estate is usually a really good investment. So if you have real estate to pledge, you're going to be able to get a better offer on the rates. And then we start climbing up the ladder. Say it's not your personal home, but say it's a piece of commercial real estate. Well, that's a little more risky because commercial districts can change. Then we start going up to, well, I don't have any real estate, but I have this type of equipment. So if it's a piece of equipment, like um, something very solid, like um, CNC machinery equipment, the last 15, 20 years, um, that's really good collateral. It's something that can easily be sold if your business goes, goes um, out. Versus restaurant equipment or clothing racks, that's less collateral. And as you climb up the ladder, the type of business also affects the risk. So if you just graduated from dental school and you did very well in dental school and you're going back to your hometown and you're gonna be the first woman dentist in your town to have your own business, that is less risky than if you just graduated from college with a marketing degree and you're going to your hometown to open a shoe store. All right, people have teeth, everybody has teeth. Towns are growing, they need dentists. Um, we have very good research we can track in areas about what the need is for a dentist, et cetera. It's going to be riskier to open a shoe store. Yeah, everybody wears shoes, but you need to understand the concept and the attitude from the banker toward this as to the risk, because the banker's job is to make sure that loan gets paid back. And one thing I'll tell you, and I, it's so funny, I used to hear this all the time from people when I worked at the Small Business Center. They're like, I I'm scared to go to a bank. I'm scared they're going to loan me a whole bunch of money and I can't pay it back. And I would always just kind of say, why would a banker want to loan you more money than you can possibly pay back? those loan officers like their jobs and they have families to support and they like their bank. You know, that's their job is to help you analyze your business potential and decide. Bankers are not gonna loan you more money than you need. They're probably gonna loan you more than you think, less, less than you think you need, but they're gonna tell you why and they're gonna help you walk through that process of making sure your plan for your business can truly pay that loan back. The second one is the line of credit. I talked about that a little bit earlier. So the line of credit is dependent on the potential for your business or how the business is currently operating. And that's like a little loan that kind of floats out there. And so I always would encourage people get the principal and interest loan to pay for the equipment you need, the construction and build out for the store, um, your insurance, your first few months of working capital, what you need to open the store. But then you need the line of credit, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars that's out there for you to use if there's a snowstorm and an ice storm, which we haven't had in a while. But there's sometimes in Arkansas, an ice storm can shut everything down for two weeks and no electricity. So that means you don't have any sales and you need to pay your employees. If you have a line of credit, you can contact your bank 
uh, loan officer and say, hey, can you drop a couple thousand in our bank account? We need to make payroll and the store has been closed for two weeks. And then it's also like I told you for those opportunities to buy new inventory and things like that. And on those, if you don't draw money down, you don't pay anything. There's no payment. It, it just sits there. When you draw the money down, then you're going to make an interest only payment and the interest rate is negotiated with the bank. Um, all, all the banks have, have their own discretion on what the rates are. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the SBA loans, how they have a ceiling. You can't go much higher on those than the SBA allows. But these lines of credit, then you only have to pay a small fee every few years when you renew it and you make that interest only payment and then you pay that principal off when you're able to. So in a couple months, then you pay all of that off when you've sold that new set of bicycles or all those new shoes. And so these are the two main types of loans that we like to advise people to look at with the bankers. So we've talked a lot about the SBA. Here's a little bit of an explanation about it. It's been around since 1953 and it is a corporation owned by the US government and it backs the loans. It encourages the banks because these loans are so risky, the SBA uh, tells the bank, if you're set up properly and we've approved you, you can make these loans and we'll send documents for people to sign up on and we'll have this agreement with you. And then if the loan fails, after you've liquidated the collateral, sold the building, sold the equipment, inventory, whatever was left when the, when the business failed, and if you as the bank did everything we told you to, like got three years copies of tax returns, lent to a borrower that actually has a resume and experience in the industry, a person who is a US citizen, all these different um, requirements, then we will pay you back 75 or 50% of what the bank is owed because it wasn't the bank's fault that the loan failed. And so this makes banks more likely to lend to borrowers. It's also better for small business borrowers and startups because typically SBA loans require less cash infusion by you into the business and it will give you a longer term typically than an in-house bank loan would where it's just made from the bank, no SBA government backing. But all of these loans are dependent upon the bank. And you can see here in this slide, I talk about the preferred lenders. Those are banks that have been investigated by the SBA and they can make their own decisions in-house on almost every SBA loan. Um, and then other banks in our area will do larger loans for small businesses and they're not preferred lenders. They have to send off the application and get approval from the SBA directly um, in Washington, D.C., but that just adds sometimes a few weeks to the process. So there are different kinds of SBA packages. What I hope you leave with here today is just kind of basically understanding the difference between an in-house loan and we're going to talk about some of the advantages to those versus the SBA loan, which this was created by the government to encourage the growth of small businesses. And the SBA specifically has programs to support women. We have an SBA Women's Business Center located in South Arkansas, because in South Arkansas, they don't have as many resources as we are blessed to have up here in Northwest Arkansas. And it is to encourage women. The SBA wants to encourage women the SBA wants to encourage minorities with businesses and veterans because those are persons that we have seen historical discrimination against by our government in the past. And the SBA is part of our government and this is part of our government trying to make up for this past discrimination against these groups and to bring us all to where we need to be so that we have equal access for all citizens to small business ownership. Also, there are SBA loans, and um, used to, I would just skim over this and talk about disaster loans, but now in the last few months, SBA disaster loans have become very important, and everybody knows about disaster loans now. Um, there are uh, SBA banks that do SBA loans and banks that don't. After the recent crisis, a lot more banks do SBA loans. Um, and these SBA lines of credit can typically give you a longer term. And then there are some called the express program, which have special benefits and features as well, if they're under 350,000. 
Um, veterans, there are some um, veteran um, special programs because once again, it's the government. The government wants to say thank you to its veterans and encourage its veterans who have had some issues in the past assimilating back into society and gaining access to business ownership. And now I want to, um, as we go through these slides, let Lance, uh, who's the pro, start telling you about some of these SBA program eligibilities. So Lance, I'll let you kind of read through these and talk about the parts you want to, and then you just holler back at me and tell me when you want me to go to the next slide. Okay, uh, one thing I wanted to provide to you, the SBA Express Loan Program that Martha mentioned, uh, it, currently has uh, a maximum limit of $1 million through December 31st of mm -hmm. 2020. Uh, that was part of the CARES Act. Uh, and, and I'm going to, just before I dive into SBA, give you a few things that the CARES Act has done for small businesses. Another example of support on any SBA loan that is fully dispersed and funded prior to September the 27th, uh, they will receive the CARES Act payments, which are six payments made on an existing dispersed SBA loan. Uh, so if, if a small business came in and got an SBA loan and, and that loan was dispersed prior to September the 27th, they would not have a payment until April of 2021. SBA would make those payments. So those are a couple things that the CARES Act uh, provided uh, that are different. And again, the Express Lending Program, which is an excellent program, uh, it, it is a way to deliver SBA financing to you on a quicker basis because the bank can use many of their own forms and analysis. Uh, the CARES Act increased the Express Limit to a million dollars through December 31st. Uh, basic eligibility, SBA does have some requirements and, and I'm sure Many of you have, have heard of the Paycheck Protection Program loans, and some of these eligibility requirements were thrown out the window for Paycheck Protection loans. But one of the primary uh, caveats is that you are a for-profit business in the U.S. Now, again, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program was a completely separate uh, financing product that SBA had, and nonprofit businesses like churches, daycares, and others could get a PPP loan, but for a regular SBA 7A or Express loan, you have to be a for-profit business. Uh, you need to be small. Now, small depends on the type of business you are, and I'll just give, and I think everyone that that is on here probably would get this, but just for general information purposes, most retail businesses are considered small when their revenue level is below $2 million. Most wholesalers and manufacturers are considered small when they have fewer than 500 employees. Uh, SBA does require equity injection uh, on most small business loans. Um, for any startup business, that equity injection is 10% of the total project amount. That can be accomplished uh, in a few different ways. One could be just a 10% cash equity injection. Uh, another could be if you're acquiring a business, like if you're buying a business, it could be 5% financing uh, on the part of the seller of that business that's on standby, which means they cannot receive payments for the term of the loan and 5% cash from, from you, the small business owner. Uh, the other thing, it could be a 10%, Martha talked about family members and family members historically have been a strong source of equity, a family member could gift it to you, but it does require a gift letter and agreement that there's no expectation of repayment. Um, SBA has a rule called credit elsewhere. Uh, we have to look at your personal financial statements and your ability to acquire financing and make sure that you could not get this loan somewhere else on reasonable terms. Um, also, the loan funds have to be used for business purposes. They can't uh, my favorite story, if you guys ever follow, I'm sure you follow the newspaper, but uh, an SBA borrower got an SBA loan and ran out and bought a Lamborghini and a Rolex watch and, and paid some child support. And that SBA borrower is now in jail. It has to be used for business purposes. It could be working capital, acquisition of equipment, acquisition of real estate, 
any legitimate business purpose is fine for SBA loan proceeds. So let's go to the next slide, Martha. Um, some of the basics, you, you either need to be a U.S. citizen or a LPR. Uh, there are some circumstances where you still might uh, be eligible for an SBA loan if you're not a citizen or LPR, but basically uh, being a citizen or LPR is a very important part of eligibility. Um, you very important thing to remember you we have to check something called cavers which doesn't mean anything to most people on this call but i know martha knows what cavers is and odwin does uh it is a way to check and see if you've defaulted on any federal government loan that could be an fha loan probably the most relevant category for most are student loans uh if you've defaulted on a student loan uh sba cannot provide financing to somebody who has defaulted on a student loan, or I'm sorry, a federally backed loan. Uh, the felonies, um, SBA used to be a hard no for anybody that has a conviction. Now, uh, most misdemeanor convictions are okay. Uh, if you are currently convicted of a felon, felony or are incarcerated, which I don't suspect you are, uh you would not be eligible for an sba loan but guys i've done loans for martha probably remembers this story if you ever had a i had a i had a borrower who had a speeding ticket 10 years prior to application for going they like fast cars they were going 95 miles an hour in a 50 mile an hour zone and we had to provide full detail and explanation of what they did five years ago but we were still able to get the SBA loan. Uh, SBA's collateral rules, uh, SBA has in their SOP, it states that no SBA loan can be declined because of a lack of collateral. But SBA does state that the bank is expected to take all available collateral. Most importantly, we have to take a collateral position on any assets that are acquired with SBA loan funds in addition to that, if that doesn't fully secure the loan, then we have to look at your personal assets, which may include the possibility of taking a junior lien position on your personal residence if you have equity in that. Uh, SBA does require personal guarantees of the owners of 20% or more of the small business. So if you're looking for an SBA loan, you're gonna have to guarantee it. Um, so, I mean, the big, at the bottom is real clear. The big kicker is if you've defaulted on a federal government loan, student loan, FHA loan, uh, SBA loan, USDA loan, uh, you would not be eligible for an SBA loan. Uh, that also includes if you, and, and probably not the case, but sometimes I'll see applications where a borrower is an owner in another business and that business may have defaulted on a federal government loan. Uh, that would cause you to not be eligible as well. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, again, we talked about size standards. Most retail businesses, some are $2 million, um, some are up to $7.5 million. Wholesale and manufacturing businesses, wholesale is 100, but it varies. Uh, if, if you were large enough to have issues with size standards, you could always email me at lance.sexton.ozk.com. I've got a nice little spreadsheet that allows me to look at each NAICS code, which uh, NAICS code is the North American Industrial Classification System. It's what used to be the OSIC code, but it's just a classification for each type of business and we can look it up real quick and see if you meet that size standard. But if you look at Northwest Arkansas, aside from J.B. Hunt, Tyson Foods, Walmart, and, and a small group of other businesses, most people will qualify as a small business. Uh, you can use uh, SBA loan funds to buy land. Now, here's something that's important. If you're buying land to build a business in, and SBA would want you to start that project in less than 12 months if the loan purpose was just for acquisition of land. Uh, you can improve if you've got a building that needs a new parking lot or some new landscaping. That's an acceptable use of SBA funds. You can buy new equipment if you want to. Uh, inventory, 
You can buy supplies, raw materials, working capital is one of my favorite categories. Martha knows I always preach that if a bank is going to lend you money for equipment, if a bank is going to lend you money for real estate to get a business started, they need to give you some working capital as well. And I am a huge proponent. You will not see a loan that I work on that does not have a working capital component to it because I've always believed that our job is not just to get you into business, but help you stay in business. Uh, there are some energy conservation programs with SBA. Another thing, <clears throat> Martha was talking about online sources of capital. And, and I see more and more of this every day that I work in this industry. SBA loans can, <clears throat> hang on one sec. SBA loans can be used to refinance debts that are on unreasonable terms. Unreasonable terms, an example of that is an excessively high interest rate, or it could be a term that is shorter, like a real estate loan on seven years, or an equipment loan on three years. Those are considered unreasonable terms. Let's go ahead and go to the next one. Um, SBA programs, uh, the 7A program and the 504 program, by the way, is an incredible loan program where uh, the bank does the, it's a, basically a split of the loan between the bank and an SBA debenture issue. A 504 loan is typically 50% of the project is done for, by the bank, 40% is done through an SBA debenture issue and 10% is the equity that you're required to inject. The bank portion is done on normal bank terms and will have a normal bank interest rate, but the debenture issue is where the great advantage is. Debenture issues right now, uh, Martha and everybody that's on the call, the current debenture rates are somewhere around 2.6, 2.7% fixed rate for 25 years. However, a 504 loan can only be used for commercial real estate and fixed business equipment. So it's a great program. Uh, Microloans Forge over in Huntsville, Martha and shake your head if I'm right. Yeah, Forge and is, uh, and, and um, Communities Unlimited in Fayetteville also. Okay. Yeah, it used to be a guy at Forge in, in Huntsville, Charlie Stockton. I don't know if Charlie is still there, but uh, I was the director of the Small Business Development Center at the University of Arkansas Walton College of Business, where Martha also was at one time, but, but Forge, and you said, who else, Martha, I'm sorry? Does micro lending? Uh, Communities Unlimited, they have an office in Fayetteville and they do SBA micro loans. Uh, excellent. Disaster loans, we've heard a lot about EIDL loans recently with uh, the pandemic. Uh, SBA has disaster loan centers. In fact, I was deputy director at SBA for a few years uh, working in the eastern half of the United States. And um, when, I, when I did that, there were disaster centers in Birmingham, El Paso, Texas, and one out in California that helped get loan funds out in terms of disasters. Now, a lot of people, uh, the EIDL loans that came out as a result of the pandemic, a lot of people were concerned because it took a little while and it was a slow process. Well, guys, the disaster loan program is, is accustomed to responding to a specific event like a hurricane or a tornado or a flood. Those usually only affect part of a state or maybe part of two or three states. Uh, the pandemic was a brand new animal for the SBA because it affected all 50 states, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Uh, so the disaster program was responding to an incredible number of requests. And I, I just want to say PPP loans, I don't know if anybody got one or may have gotten one from us or other lending institutions. I always like to share this story. SBA's typical lending year uh, is $30 billion across the United States. The PPP loan program got 500 and yesterday's count was 512 billion dollars out in a period of about three months. So they effectively did not 20 years, Martha and I were talking about this, but almost 20 years worth of lending in three months. So, uh, you know, it, it was quite a success in helping entrepreneurs. Uh, 
One of the greatest resources SBA has is Small Business Development Center program. There is one at the Walton College of Business. That, uh, it is an exceptional program. Martha and I both have worked there. They can help you with business planning, marketing research. Uh, when you come to the bank looking for an SBA loan, and if you're a startup business, we're gonna wanna see a solid written business plan with two years worth of projections that are supported by a good summary of assumptions. The Small Business Development Center can help you with that and it is a free service. Uh, SCORE, Northwest Arkansas has one of the best SCORE programs uh, in Arkansas and in this part of the country. Uh, I think you can go online and look up SCORE. Uh, these are retired executives that provide consulting assistance to small business owners. Women Business Centers, there's one in South Arkansas. Um, veteran Outreach is excellent. One thing I wanted to mention, the Veterans Advantage Program, the CARES Act extended uh, the Veterans Advantage fee waiver on SBA Express loans uh, forever. Uh, that used to be a temporary year-to-year -year funding issue. The CARES Act extended the Veterans Advantage fee waiver on SBA Express loans uh, for the entirety of the program, so it doesn't have to get renewed over and over. And with the new SBA Express maximum limit of a million dollars, uh, that would save a small, let's say a veteran borrowed a million dollars through the Express program, that would save that veteran a $15,000 SBA guarantee fee. Uh, so that's been extended. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Yeah, and here, I'm sorry, Lance, I didn't tell you. So this is the contact info um, place for uh, Forge. And so this is part of what we'll be sending out um, after this is a PDF copy of this presentation. So it'll have for you the website for those micro lenders that Lance talked about. And then it's also gonna have for you uh, Lance's contact info and mine. And I wanna interject, you know, this is a lot of information about a lot of resources. And so you're gonna have my contact information. That's, you know, what we do here at Startup Junkie is a, a lot of the chambers tell people we're the top of the funnel, right? So we're a great place to start and we're going to help connect you to all these area resources. So for example, if you're making salsa at home and you have an opportunity to sell it to Harps, we're going to connect you to the Food Innovation Center at the U of A where you can get a manufacturer's permit and have a commercial kitchen to make your salsa. And then we're going to work with you on getting your business plan together. And if you actually need cash flow projections and market research for a bank loan, we're going to send you to the Small Business Development Center. So feel free to reach out to us to ask about any of these. This is a lot of information at once. But, you know, like I said, here at Start Junkie, we meet with 800 to 900 people a year. We provide events for about 10,000 people. So we're happy to help you go down that funnel to find the resources that you need to help you and to connect you with all of these um, different area resources. One thing I really encourage people to do, I send this to everybody, go to sba.gov. It is the biggest library of free information about small business. There's guides on marketing. There's guides on understanding taxes. We're not saying you should do your own tax return. Don't do that. But when you go read about the difference between an LLC and a sole proprietorship and an S Corp, when you go read about the tax advantages of being an LLC, but filing as an S Corp classification, when you understand that, when you go meet with a small business attorney or go meet with an accountant, you can have a conversation with them instead of paying them $250 an hour to educate you, okay? So we want you to learn all of these processes. There are sites on there that talk about the very big difference between an employee and a 1099 contractor. That's a very important classification. You need to understand, you can't just write on the piece of paper that somebody doing work for you is a 1099 contractor. You don't get to decide that. The IRS decides that. So you need to educate yourself. If you can go to sba.gov and not get lost for 20 minutes reading some interesting articles, you probably don't like small business enough to want to do it full time. It's just a really great resource and an incredible um, website. I'm going to have, you're going to see here, I'm going to have in this presentation how to contact SCORE and get an appointment possibly with them for some help. 
And especially SCORE is great for people who are wanting to start a nonprofit because um, typically, um, especially the uh, Small Business Development Center, and they're located down the street from us um, um, on Dixon and Block, they're actually now, Lance, FYI, they're actually now part of the new Office of Economic Development at the University of Arkansas. They're not with the Walton College anymore. They're still part of the U of A and supported by the U of A, but their office is just down the street from us. Um, they and SCORE, they both work together uh, to provide um, services for for-profit, but SCORE will also help you with nonprofit formation. And so this is that ASBTDC, that's their new director, and this is their website link I'll have for you. And so in closing out, we've talked a lot about SBA loans and I, you know, I, I lived in the SBA loan world for three years myself with a local bank. Lance has lived in that world a long time and they are great, but I'm not going to tell you they're the only option. So if you're fortunate enough to own a piece of real estate that's paid for, if you're fortunate enough to have an 840 credit score, if you're fortunate enough to have a family member who has an excellent income, a good credit score, and wants to co-sign for you an in-house bank loan, meaning the bank doesn't need the guarantee from the government. They don't want that. They're comfortable with the loan as it is and the collateral that's pledged. Those can be more flexible. You know, I hear from people all the time, oh, I don't want to do SBA loan. It's too, it's too confusing. It's too much paperwork. Well, if it's a preferred lender, it's not. You're dealing with the loan officer and say you need to sell your house and buy another house. The loan officer can type up a memo. They're going to get information, just whatever you've collected about the new house sell and purchase. They're going to do a memo and they're just going to swap that lien from one house to another, making sure they've still got the same kind of collateral. So you're still dealing, you know, these Disaster loans that we've been hearing about, yes, those are you directly dealing with the SBA, but that's extremely rare. Your SBA local loan officer takes care of all that for you. But yes, there you do have to get permission to do certain things. Sometimes they have to reach out to the SBA. They'll do that for you to get permission. An in-house loan, it's up to the board at that bank. It's up to that bank president or perhaps that loan officer if it's within their lending authority. So it can be more flexible. The downside is the loans are gonna have shorter payback. They're probably like if it's for land, it may balloon every five years, which means there's a renegotiation process for the terms of the loan. But um, sometimes those can be really community friendly, really, you know, as your business progresses in a few years, you might get a better interest rate. Um, and you might feel like the bank has more control over the decisions with it. So um, those are good for larger loans um, and they can also save the SBA fee. So I told you the SBA is a corporation. It's owned by the government. One of the reasons the SBA has survived for 70 years is because both sides of the political perspective like it because it funds itself. So certain sides um, in our political arenas like it because it encourages loans to low income people, to minorities, to women, that's wonderful. But other sides of our spectrum really like the fact that the program pays for itself because it collects a fee. The bank can loan you that fee as part of your loan package, but you are going to pay for the privilege of getting that loan. And most of my startups were more than happy to pay that 3% fee because they had no other hope for a loan anywhere else. And then the bank is going to pay a little fee to the SBA to, to be able to administer the program. So in-house loans are another option. So if you have a great relationship with a local bank and they don't do SBA lending and you've got great credit and some good collateral or people who will co-sign for you, that is an option, something that you can think about and you can discuss. But once again, that's why you want to have a relationship with a banker. They're going to offer you the best package. They don't want you going around town. They don't want to make you a loan and then have you go down the street and find out that that was a credit loan package because then you're going to bat them out of them all over town. They're not going to do that. They're going to help you find the best loan package for you and your current um, situation. So this is just a little rundown chart to show you the difference. Um, some of the differences between SBA loans and non-SBA bank loans, the big thing is the maturity. With the SBA backing, the banks are a little more um, secure about giving you a longer term. 
on those lines of credit. Sometimes you can maybe get a two or three year line of credit, meaning you've got a chance to pay that down, pay it off, and you don't have to pay that annual renewal fee. And so that's helpful. And then it mentions, you know, there's all different kinds of SBA loans. There are certain ones for exporting and we have an incredible resource with the Arkansas World Trade Center up in Rogers, I can refer you to people there if you're thinking about exporting your goods to another country to sell online or in person, they can help you with that. That's a free service um, that we here at Startup Junkie can help connect you to. So it's a lot of info. And like I said, um, Caleb's gonna email out to you a PDF of this presentation so you have it. Um, you can type in these words in sba.gov or you know, sometimes be careful about where it's coming from, but even in Google to understand these terms. What I want, most want to see is women empower themselves by becoming educated about finance. Um, not everyone, but sometimes a lot of women were not um, taught financial um, acumen and history. And this stuff is not hard, it's just new. You, you, if you've never looked at getting a business loan, this presentation should have been a little overwhelming to you. It should be, because it's new. It doesn't mean it's hard. It doesn't mean it's not something you can learn but we have given you a great list of resources of people who are here to help explain that to you and help why I tell people all the time when I'm in consulting um, uh, sessions. Okay, do, do you know what this term means? And sometimes people are embarrassed and I'm like, why should you know what APR is if you've never had a loan? I have meetings with 20 year olds. They're like, I don't know what APR is. That doesn't mean you're stupid. It means you've never had a discussion about APR. That's my job. That's Lance's job. It's our job to help educate you and teach you this process so you can make a, a qualified, intelligent decision about what direction you want to go. But don't be scared of the process. Be empowered by learning about it. No one's going to make you take a loan you don't want. No bank in its right mind is going to loan you more money than it should based upon the research and the data and the projection you have for your startup or the plan you have for expansion for your current business. There are all different steps to take and in Northwest Arkansas we have so many people who are here to help you. We are very, very fortunate to have lots of support systems, different entities funded by major groups like the Northwest Arkansas Council, the Walton Family Foundation, the Arkansas Economic Development Commission, our chambers of commerce. You join a chamber with your business and you have a staff of 10, 15, 20 people to help you. So, so do reach out to all of us and let us help you. And the majority of these folks I'm talking about, no one charges anything. We're all in it for the mission um, to empower you. So Caleb, do you see some questions for us that we can work on with folks? Um, I don't have any questions just yet. Arlene Jones had a uh, good comment though. She said, Martha rocks and I'd have to agree. <laughs> Hi Arlene. Hey Martha, I wanna, I wanna share with you uh, what you said about SBA terminology and sometimes people being intimidated. I'd worked in the industry for many years when I took the position as deputy director at SBA. So I call my first staff meeting and uh, my director of SBA purchase packages for express loans, 504 loans and SBA servicing all come in and we have our first staff meeting. They start throwing acronyms out right and left and I've been working in the industry. I had to sit down with legal pad. I wrote down 10 or 15 acronyms. I had no clue what it meant. And then I had to go back to my office and figure it out. So Martha's exactly right. Some, and Martha does an incredible job of helping to explain things in a way that people understand, but don't let the government terminology scare you. An SBA loan is an exceptional way uh, to get your small business started, to help it grow. Uh, and I do want to mention, and this is not a shameless plug, we are a preferred lender at Bank OCK, which Martha mentioned, preferred lender status. Yes, and, th and that's what I encourage people is, you know, I always ask someone, do you already have a banking relationship with someone? 
but looking for those banks that are preferred lenders, and we have a list of those. Um, I think we've got someone on the line, um, a, a loan officer who's here from Arvest. Arvest is a preferred lender. We have lots of options in Northwest Arkansas for you. Um, and I'm just here to help guide people. You're going to make the final decision where you go and, and what you want. And um, we're just here to make sure you look at all the different options. And I love it when people find out about other options that I don't know about. In fact, it was just last year I found out about Communities Unlimited, which is an SBA micro lender. And that means they do loans less than $50,000. And I didn't even know they had a Fayetteville office. So I reached out to the main office in Little Rock. I connected with them. I got to know them and found them as a new resource for some of my borrowers who are unable to possibly qualify for bank loans yet. So always feel free to share that with me. I, we are a receptor of information um, to disseminate. That's what we do here at Startup Junkie. So anybody else have any questions if you wanna type them in? Otherwise, I've, I've never had people be mad at me for finishing up early. <laughs> so we'll let everyone go and maybe grab a bite for lunch. Okay, Odwin, would you like to say goodbye to everyone on behalf of the bank, maybe? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Martha. Uh, you and Lance do a tremendous job, and it's really amazing to me. As long as I've been in this, every time I get a chance to listen to uh, either of you, I learn something new. So uh, thank you for, uh, for leading this. And I might just add that uh, as I'm, I'm thinking about all the different aspects of this, is uh, I've, of course, been, in, been in, in the banking business for over 30 years as well. And uh, Bank OZK was built uh, by helping small businesses grow. That was our forte where we might be 20 plus billion, but let me promise you this. We it's been built on working with small businesses, and one of the things that any good banker, I don't care what bank you're with, it all starts with listening. Uh, we're not going to open up a book and go to a playbook and say, this is what you need to do. It all starts by listening, and that's exactly what Martha does and Lance does. When they sit down with you and talk with you, it's listening to your ideas and what you're wanting to do. And I applaud the ladies who uh, are participating today. Uh, it is uh, uh, what you're venturing out to do is so much needed. And uh, for any minority that's trying to grow a business, it's just fantastic what you're trying to do. And so we want to be there to support you and help you in any way possible. And, uh, and so I just uh, 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 am, am excited. I, I, one other thing comes to mind is sometimes an answer that we might give might seem like a no is not the right answer. Uh, but I have had situations where we sit and guided a, a customer, talked to them, listened to them, and ended up we couldn't do it, okay, which is not ever a fun thing for any of us. Uh, they end up going across the street or wherever and they get a, a, a loan and they plow ahead to do it and then it doesn't result in a good situation. It's just, it's working together and making sure that we collectively come up with a good decision. And, uh, uh, and I, I just love to, uh, love doing this and love working with you. Thanks, Martha. And thanks, Lance. Okay, thank you all. We don't have any more questions, so we'll let everyone go enjoy their day and have a great week and reach out to any of us at any time. You know, I've had people contact me a year later and say, hey, I was in your seminar in Springdale a year ago, and I'm like, great, glad to see you. So, and we're here at Startup Junkie to just talk to you if you're thinking about it, if you're ready to go, or reach back out to us in a year. I assume we'll still be here. We've been here uh, for uh, since uh, 2011. We'll keep plowing ahead and being here for Northwest Arkansas. So thank you all. Thanks, Lance. Thank Thanks, Odwin. Bye-bye.